Good evening, tubers. Matt and Roy back once again. Woo! Really hot. Matter of fact, let's take a little sip here. I hope that everybody is doing well today. Uh, if you live in any area where, like where we are in the southeast, then uh, I'm pretty sure that you're dealing with the same mind-numbing heat that I'm dealing with here. Uh, temperatures have gotten down uh, up, I should say, into the low 100s, actual temperatures, very close to the low 100s. Heat index, when you factor in the humidity, it's up around 110. And I kid you not, I've been outside uh, just as maybe about five minutes ago, and just being outside for about two, three minutes you can see that I am a ball of sweat. My face is sweating. You can see I got sweat all over my shirt. Um, so we'll give a minute for other people to get here, and then I'm going to talk about things that you need to do to make sure you keep yourself safe during these incredibly hot times. Uh, Stephen Barber and George Blakely are here. Nice to see you guys. Stay cool. I'm going to try. My room's actually pretty cool right now. I have the fan going up here. If you guys have never seen this before, I have a ceiling fan, which you may not be able to see unless I go like that. There it is right there. We installed that when we first moved in this house about 20 years ago. So that fan is getting on the old side, but it's a, um, what is it? A uh, Huntington? Yeah, Huntington fan, I think they call it, and it is really durable. So that stays on most of the time, honestly. Yep, Stephen Barber, good good point there. He says, stay hydrated and wear sunscreen. That's if you can wear sunscreen. Uh, some, of, some people out there, I am one of them, are allergic to sunscreen. If I put sunscreen on my face or anywhere on my arms, I will break out in hives. So my only option is to wear hats, or in my case, when I'm outside bike riding, I have one of the those uh, professional helmets that have the brim that goes way over to keep the sun out of my face. Even so, I do I do have a tan more than I have in years past. Chepele, hey Matt, long time no see on my end. Was on vacation in Maine, so couldn't tune in for the last 10 days. I'm already missing the amazing northeast weather. Oh, I'm not surprised. I'm actually kind of surprised it isn't hot up there. Uh, believe it or not, you know, I'm from upstate New York originally. And by this time, even up there, you see temperatures in the high 80s, low 90s. And it could be as humid, if not even more humid up there, especially if you're from like the Great Lakes region or the Adirondack, because where there's more water, you have a lot more humidity. Yep, I agree, Chet. He says, uh, hydration is the key. Even the shade, you need water. Humidity is a s silent and damp monster. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say silent. It will come up on you quickly. And the way you know that uh, the humidity is affecting you is the amount of sweat. Like if you, if you start sweating profusely um, and then all of a sudden you stop sweating, you say, oh, that's nice. I'm not sweating anymore. That's when you're in trouble because you are actually out of water and you're dehydrated. And that's about minutes before you can succumb to heat, heat uh, stroke. And a lot of people have done it. I've succumbed to heat stroke in the past. My dad has several times. And it is something that can kill you, believe it or not. You can die from heat stroke. So you got to be really, really careful. And the best thing to do is to stay hydrated. Now, Water works fine for most instances, but sometimes if you are really dehydrated and it's really hot out there, you need to look at something like a sports drink, a Gatorade, a Powerade, something that has electrolytes because water 
does not have the sodium or the electrolytes in there to rehydrate you if you're um, extremely dehydrated. And I know a few of you out there uh, called me on that saying, Matt, how can you say that? Those things are terrible for you. You need to stick to water. Well, in most cases, that is true. But sometimes simply drinking water is just not enough. You need to have all that extra um, sodium and the uh, electrolytes to bring your uh, balance back up. Eric says, I've been drinking uh, over a gallon of water per day just at work. I, again, not surprised on these hot days. I can finish off a gallon. As a matter of fact, I started this late last night. So this is almost a day's worth. So it's about half, half done. And that's not all I drank. I mean, I've drank a lot of other stuff too, coffee, which, and that's, that's something I really need to, to address here too. If you're a big coffee drinker like I am, uh, you actually have to drink more water the more coffee you drink because coffee will actually dehydrate you. Coffee is a diuretic. So when you're drinking coffee, um, it's going to cause your body to dehydrate quicker. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think, oh, heck, the liquid's a liquid. You drink it and you're going to hydrate. That's not, the, that's not true. Coffee is a diuretic. Uh, soda is a diuretic. And even tea is a diuretic. And a lot of people don't realize that. Stephen Barber says, during the summer, I stay away from coffee lately. I've been drinking more water. That's good. That's good. Again, water, as long as you don't let your electrolytes go down too much, water should be fine. Mark Covenant says, hey, Matt, remember me? It is also okay to wear a baseball cap when out in the hot weather we're getting. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. You guys ever seen this? <laughs> I got this at Dollar Tree. Uh, it is red. The, the camera makes it look orange, I think, because of the light. So, yeah, that reminds me. Mark, I'm glad you said that. I'm going to start wearing this when I'm outside, especially doing uh, yard work and things like that. So I have a big head, so I have to adjust this down a little bit. Let's see. There we go. That's a little bit better. Maybe I should wear it now because I got that uh, fluorescent light staring me in the face. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Douglas Burkholder said, I sent you a friend request on Facebook. Let me check that out. I have not been through my uh, Facebook friend requests in some time, mainly because uh, it doesn't always come up properly. Let me see. I don't see it, Doug. So you may want to go ahead and send me another one. For some reason, uh, it didn't go through. Chipotle said, hot tea is a great alternative to coffee in the morning. You can even find black teas with a kick to get you going in the a.m. I like the one called Morning Thunder, if anyone is interested. That is a good point. Even though tea is technically a diuretic, it's not as bad as coffee or uh, soda. So you can drink tea, but once again, you still need to supplement that with water as well. Uh, Stephen Barber says, and please, please keep pets inside. I leave mine inside. I fear if I leave for work and she's outside, I will worry about her. So I leave her inside with the air on. That is an excellent point. Uh, we don't always think about our pets um, on really hot days. Uh, especially dogs, uh, the only way they can sweat is through their uh, tongue. Dogs have no sweat glands. They actually sweat through their tongue. You ever see a dog pant? He goes, <laughs> well, if, they, if their mouth dries up and uh, they start getting dehydrated and their tongue dries up, like you ever have dry tongue, then they actually can't cool themselves off and they can actually die from heat stroke that way. So yes, if you have dogs or cats, but in this case, I'm talking more specifically about dogs and it is really hot, you need to keep them inside because they might finish off whatever water you give them and then that's it. I mean, they have no way to literally cool themselves off after that. Spider Guard is here. Hey, Spider Guard. He and I had a little heated debate about the uh, vlog that I put up earlier. And we're talking about uh, strawberries. And yes, I do get your point. 
Um, he was saying that I was saying that what I do is I take fresh strawberries, I cut them up, I freeze them, and then I thaw them out as I need them. And I call them fresh frozen. And yes, I get it. Technically, they're not fresh after that. But the reason I do it is once strawberry season is over, that is the only way you can get semi-fresh strawberries. And the other reason I do it is I realize you can go to the grocery store and you can get frozen strawberries, frozen peaches, all that stuff in the uh, frozen food section. But the difference is a lot of times they add sugar and preservatives into those, whereas the ones that I do here, I know have nothing. I absolutely add nothing when I freeze my uh, freeze my fruit. So that's okay. I mean, I don't mind having a spirited debate. That's what this forum is all about. But I just wanted him to know where I was coming from there. He says, uh, now that I just rambled on about all that, I'll read his comment. He said, drink eight cups of water. Uh, thing is too much. Oh, I'm sorry. The eight cups of water thing is too much. It depends on the person. Uh, for somebody my size, you know, uh, six to 210 ish pounds, uh, eight cups of water actually isn't enough. I need to drink more like 10 to 12 uh, cups of water. And when they're talking about cups, they're talking about eight fluid ounces. Um, but if you're talking about, uh, a woman, maybe five, three, five, four, 110 pounds, then yeah, uh, eight cups would be too much. They may only need four to six cups of water. So it just depends on the person. Um, what you really need to do is talk to your doctor if you're concerned about how much water you should be drinking. And believe me, Physicians will be more than happy to tell you how much water you need to be drinking. Uh, they've told me that so many times. <laughs> Mark Covington, hey Matt, what is usually the best cold drink to consume during this really hot weather? Uh, again, I would stick to water. Uh, cold water is a great option. Now, if you're not much of a water drinker, there are all the, the alternatives, the sports drinks. You know, like I said, you got the um, Gatorades, the Powerades. Uh, vitamin water is another really good option. Stay away from anything that is a uh, energy drink like a monster drink or a Red Bull, those will dehydrate you. Those have tons of caffeine in there. It'll raise your metabolism. You might lose weight on those, but it will dehydrate you. Douglas Burkholder, it is hot and humid here. Storms brewing now. I live in Whitney Point and grew up in Green. They have flood warnings for Broom in Shenango County until 10 p.m. Uh, again, not surprised. I've been in green when it's flooded many times. You guys really tend to get a lot of uh, rain in that area. Um, I do love Whitney Point. I've been through there many times. I've been to Greg's Market. Um, I love the Whitney Scoop, which is a Whitney Point Scoop, which is a really good place to get um, frozen custard. And um, there's an Italian restaurant right in the middle of town that I've always wanted to try. And the name eludes me at the moment, but I'm sure you'll probably know what, what it is. But the real cool thing about Whitney Point is it's like halfway between Green and where my aunt lives in um, Newark Valley. And uh, it's, it's a perfect stopping ground. Like if we're heading over to my aunt's, then we can stop and get gas. We can stop and get a bite to eat. Really cool area, and it's actually right near uh, Interstate 81, too. You can actually pick up the interstate there, too. Mike Paradin said, hey, good video with the car from Montreal. I felt I owed it to you guys. I've been uh, putting that off for about a week, and mainly the reason was just the heat and the humidity. Um you know what? I like it. It's not the 96 Tahoe is not a perfect vehicle. It has its flaws cosmetically outside, you know, the, the roof and the hood, the paint's all faded on there. The sides look good. The interior is pretty, pretty good, except for those few little holes in the headliner. Um, but I like it for what I paid for it and what I'm going to be using it for. Um, it's, it's, it's perfect. And if I decide to keep it, which I probably will, then I might do some of the cosmetic work if it winds up being a reliable vehicle. 
you gotta look at it this way. I paid a thousand dollars for that vehicle, which is really, really cheap for any working four wheel drive vehicle. And that is a four wheel drive vehicle. Um, it, but the other end of that is I don't want to put a lot of money into it until I'm sure that it's going to be reliable for a good long time, mainly the drivetrain, the engine and the transmission. So my thought process on this is I'm going to drive it. We're actually going to be taking it up to my uncle's place in green, which is about a 500 mile trip um, up there and back. So it'll be about a thousand miles uh, round trip. If it makes it back, and forth from there without any major issues, then I'll be more inclined to, to put money into it. But I've already put a couple of hundred dollars into it already, you know, getting parts from the, the junkyard, the pick and pull, um, you know, doing some maintenance that needed to be done. So right now that's where that's sitting, but I don't want to bore you guys with that. If anybody else has any specific questions about the Tahoe, you're welcome to ask me. Douglas Burke Holder, Aleos or Dominic's? Aleos, that's the one that I was thinking about. Um, I didn't even know there was a second one there. Um, but we are going to try that next time I go there. Hopefully, maybe we can do a food review or something. Yeah, ball flats flood all the time. I see you recorded back in the day. Yeah, oh my goodness. If you guys know anything about green, um, the Shenango River uh, parallels the ball flats, which is like the lowest port part of the village of green. And they have a, a lot of events there. They have a baseball diamond there. They have concession stands, but any time they get a significant, significant amount of rain and the Schnaggle river tops its banks, that whole area gets flooded. So, um, yeah, they've had like maybe three, 500 year floods over the past decade. And I just, I, it, it boggles my mind. And the thing that gets me is the people there that have the houses that flood out every time they're rebuilding these houses. I'm like, that is like the dumbest thing I can think of because you know that it, this is a period of increased um, rain and increased flooding po probabilities. So to me, either don't rebuild there, you know, the houses are total, you know, and it's a shame because there are some older houses, but tear them down, move elsewhere, or do what some of the other people did and raise them up. Uh, there are a few um, modular houses there that they actually put on um, on sticks. They actually raise them up maybe 20 feet. And that's what I would do personally. I mean, I would never, ever buy a house in a flood prone area. It's just not worth it. And flood insurance, forget it. I mean, you, you might as well take a second mortgage out on your house to afford flood insurance. Chris Bartle said, I didn't know you were alive. I was watching about your dad's car. Uh, oh yeah. The, um, yeah, the, uh, Mercury. Yeah. We had a, a big disaster with that. Let me tell you. Um, the, the radiator sprung a leak. And when you have a 51 Mercury, you can't just go to your local auto zone or car quest or what have you and buy a new radiator. They just don't make them. So we had to take it out. I had to help dad take it out. That was a chore in and of itself. Uh, we had to take it out of the car. And we brought it to a local uh, radiator shop. Now, I'm not going to name the name of the radiator shop because it wouldn't be fair to them, although I probably should. Um, they record it, basically rebuilt the radiator. They did a good job, and the price was reasonable, but they lost two of the fittings on the bottom that, that he needed to reattach it to the radiator. And they were just little brass fillings, uh, fittings, I should say, not fillings. <laughs> um, and when he went back to get them, uh, the person that worked on it brought out two fittings that didn't fit that radiator at all. I mean, just were not for that. And it was very obvious that they weren't for that. Um, but being he was a person that worked there for many years, they believed him. So my dad didn't have a leg to stand on. So he left there and luckily went to a um, another local shop. It was a, a, a shop that sells brass fittings. And luckily they were able to find uh, two fittings that would actually work for him. But once he finally got those fittings, we were able to finish the job. And it was just one disaster after another with that. But it's all done. It's all put back in. The radiator's 
doing fine in the car. So fingers crossed we won't have any more problems with that. Eric goes, the Achilles heel of any car over 20 years old is the cooling system. I have to agree with him there. And I'm very lucky because I have really two vehicles that are over 20 years old. Well, the LeSabre is a 2000, so that's 19 years old. The uh, Tahoe is a 96, so that's 23 years old. Luckily, the people that own these vehicles did the proper maintenance for them. Uh, and the cooling systems seem to be fine on both. Again, fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, and one thing I was going to say now that Eric is here, I know Eric would be the first one to say, Matt, did you do a tune-up on that, Tahoe? Did you change the spark plugs? Did you change the uh, wires? Because I know that you do that with all your vehicles. Luckily, that had just been done before I got the vehicle. Um I, I, you know, I don't ever take anybody's word for it. I do check on people's work. And when I went under the, uh, under the hood, I could tell that the, um, the wires were pretty much brand new. You could tell that they, they had been changed very recently. I have not pulled a spark plug out yet, which I may or may not do as well as it's running. I'll probably just let sleeping dogs lie. You know, basically that means if you don't have a problem, don't, don't aggravate it. Don't make a problem, make it into a problem. Um, but I might, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Eric, you know what? Give me, give me your advice on that, buddy. Eric goes, to be fair, anytime you take anything to a machine shop, you should remove anything that is removable first. You know, dad said the same thing. And uh, his, his I want to say an excuse, but his reason behind why he didn't, um, he just plain forgot. I mean, there's a lot of things you have to remove and those two fittings he just totally forgot to take off. But yeah, I, I get your point. It, that's definitely true. Hmm. I need to take another sip of water. I'm actually sitting here watching um, Cincinnati Picker. Uh, he's a guy on YouTube that I've been watching lately. I've been very impressed with his videos. Um, he does the same thing I do pretty much. He goes to garage sales, uh, finds items, and he does the reselling game where he basically uh, – you know, maybe cleans them up a little bit, adds some value and, and sells them on things like, I think he uses eBay more than like the Facebook marketplace, Craigslist offer up, but I think he does use those uh, platforms as well. I'd like to try to start doing some videos like he does. I'll be honest with you. Um, he, he actually goes with like a, I think he has a GoPro and he films at these garage sales getting the stuff. And then at the end, he does a, uh, a video where he shows everything that he picked up. Um, I don't know if I have the courage to do that. I would be a little nervous. I, I, just to me, just bringing a, a camera to somebody's garage sale is kind of like an invasion of privacy. M maybe that's just me. I don't know. But um, I kind of would like to give it a try. Let me know what you guys think. Would you guys be interested in seeing videos like that where I bring uh, maybe a, my GoPro? I have that GoPro Hero 3 to garage sales, you know, film film some of these sales and then, you know, do the, do the uh, finds video at the end of that. If you like that, let me know. Chippewa says, poor Louisiana. Seems like the whole state, especially the part on the coast, is a complete flood zone. Uh, it is. I have to agree there. And, you know, Hurricane Katrina was really, I'm, I got to take this off, was the first time we saw there was a, a big problem there. But to be honest with you, if they kept up the levees over the years and didn't let them degrade, then it wouldn't have been half as bad as it was during Katrina. Uh, but again, you, you really don't want to live in a flood prone area unless you have a lot of money and, um, you have a death wish, honestly. A lot of these people came and get out of there. Eric goes, with the towel, I would make sure they used AC Delco plugs. And if they did and they look new, leave, leave it all alone. I might pull one out. I'll be honest with you guys. I have never, I, I've worked with, with the wires. I've never actually pulled a spark plug out before. And I would not do it without dad being there because... With my luck, I'd be the first one to strip a plug and really mess up my vehicle. 
Uh, so if Dan has some time over the next week, I might have him just pull one of those plugs out just to see what it looks like. And really, you only have to pull one plug out because very rarely will they ever change one spark plug. If one plug looks good, chances are the rest of them are fine as well. And since the vehicle's running perfectly fine, then I'm sure it's not going to be an issue. Chipotle said, I would much enjoy your recording that recording that process. I might give it a try. Um, I, I don't know if he gets permission from these people firsthand. I, I honestly don't think he could because as many garage sales as you go to in a day, you wouldn't get any work done. Mark Covington said, what is your, what would you say is your favorite kind of automotive work to do? Really anything that I can do. Um, I do like working on suspension. I've done uh, control arms, ball joints, tire rod ends before. Um, regular maintenance stuff, oil changes, uh, tranny services I've done before. Uh, cosmetic work, you know, I've done detailing and stuff like that. That's probably my best, my favorite thing to do. My least favorite thing when it comes to automotive is electrical work. Uh, wiring, uh, working with fuses, which I have done in the past. I really don't enjoy it. It's really hard to get to a lot of the fuse boxes in most vehicles. Not, not so in the Tahoe. Actually, the Tahoe, it's really, really easy. Eric goes, I pulled my next victim out of storage unit for sale. The This one is a small form factor Optiplex 755, I think. You want to hear some irony? I just sold a, a quad-core Optiplex 755 earlier today, um, actually about 30 minutes before I started this live stream. It's a small world, though they did make a lot of those. One thing I will tell you about the uh, Optiplex 755, make sure that you update it to the latest BIOS. And I'm going to go look that up real quick because I'm not – exactly sure what version it is. The late, it's uh, A17. If you have the Dell Opti, if it is the Dell Optiplex 755, make sure you update it the, to the latest BIOS, which is revision A17. The reason is if you have any revision before that, it will not um, recognize any more than four gigs of RAM. I, it, I don't know why. I think it was a limitation in the motherboard. If you look on Dell's website at the spec sheet for that computer, it officially only supports four gigabytes of RAM. But if you update it to the latest BIOS, you can support up to eight. It, eight is the absolute max. If you go try to go past there, it won't even boot. Uh, just an FYI for you. Hopefully that helps you out, Eric. Eric goes, I find electrical work to be therapeutic at, at times. Me, I'd rather be strangled with the wires that I'm supposed to be working with. <laughs> no, not not really. Not really. But um, I, I don't know. I just, I just don't enjoy it, honestly. I, I guess it's more of a fear of electrocution. But when it comes to car, uh, working with car electrical systems, you can't really be, really be electrocuted because it's only 12 volts. You can't really do much damage with 12 volts. Eric goes, I always update the BIOS on all systems. Have you ever been the unfortunate one to brick a system? And I, I know I know the answer to this because Eric has actually told me he's run into that before, and I've done it too. When you update a computer's BIOS, if there's any interruption in the power during that BIOS update process and you try to reboot the computer, there is a very good chance that it won't do anything. We call it bricking the system because – the system literally becomes a brick. You, that's all you could use it for is like a glorified paperweight or a brick because the BIOS is integral to doing anything with the computer. That controls everything, the memory, the hard drive, the video card. Everything is controlled by that BIOS. So if that becomes corrupted, you really can't do anything short of replacing the motherboard. And that has happened to me in the past. I've been one of the unlucky ones that that's happened to. And it wasn't 
it wasn't on one of my older systems either at the time. It was a really nice, uh, I want to say it was an AMD Athlon uh, 64 X2 dual core system. We're talking like early to mid 2000s when those were actually fast computers. Mark Coven says, can you make uh, more videos on the proper way to work on computers? Yes, I will do that. Um, and that that's on my to-do list. Um, that's definitely something I want to do. Um, maybe when I can get mom to film a little bit more, I'll definitely try to do that. <laughs> Chris Spartler goes, they're still fast, the dual core ones. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're if you're doing primarily office work, um, you know, clerical work, maybe just watching YouTube videos, yeah, dual core systems are fine. But if you're doing any kind of like advanced video editing, um, you know, picture rendering, then you definitely want to go with a quad core system now. Yeah, an SSD will, will speed up anything. Heck, if you put an SSD in an old Dell Optiplex with like a, a hyperthread Pentium 4, it would run a lot quicker. <laughs> Stephen Barber goes, when you update the BIOS, my anxiety goes high because you never know what's going to happen. So much truth there. Boy, I need more water. Again, stay hydrated out there going back to the topic of this video. You know, you need to make sure you stay hydrated. You need to make sure that uh, you stay cool. One other thing I wanted to mention, too, is um, if you have to be outside in this really hot and humid weather, um, get yourself one of those cooling pads. They actually sell them on Amazon. Um, they rubber, they go around your neck, and what you do is you put them in the freezer, and when you take them out, you put them around your neck, and it keeps your neck cool. Believe it or not, that's the area where you can actually lose the most um, coolness or heat, and in this case, it can actually absorb a lot of the uh, the cooling from that uh, from that mat or that uh, pad, and that actually helps keep your body temperature regulated. Ah, Chris Bartlett's uh, freezing over there in Australia. I take some of that cooler weather right now myself, to be honest with you. It's called a neck cooling wrap. Uh, here it is. This is the one that my godmother uses, I think. It's called the Flexi Freeze Cooling Collar. And... Let me see if I can share it. I'm probably going to have to shorten that URL up. Oh, yeah. Let me see if I can shorten this up for you guys. I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. Yeah, I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. Now that one didn't work. Try the Google. I hate it when things don't go according to plan. Can't shorten this particular one, but uh, this is what it is. You guys can do a Google search for that, but it's uh, $15 on Amazon, uh, $4.77 shipping, of course, if you have Prime, shipping's free. But basically what it is, it's a, it's a belt-looking thing that goes around your neck, and it has these removable um, little ice tray looking things, honestly, put them in the freezer. And then before you leave, you go ahead and fish them through the wrap, put it around your neck and you're good to go for a few hours. And it really does help. Believe me. I've, I've, I've seen, uh, I've never used one personally myself, but again, my godmother has them and, uh, it really does help on these hot days. The Pointer sisters. Yeah. I didn't, honestly, I knew the song, but I didn't know, uh, who actually sang it. Here's another thing. I, oh, okay. Eric, Eric just shared this. Okay. 
Uh, it could feel like 110 degrees this weekend as scorching heat moves into the region. And that's from his area. So we're talking about, uh, you know, the Northeast. So it's not just the Southeast part of the United States is dealing with this. The Northeast is now too. I don't think he'll mind if I share that uh, article, but I'm, I'm telling you, it, it's not like it's really uncommon. I mean, we deal with these heat waves year round it's just that we're tired of it, most of us, honestly. I really need this to stop. My uh, my tolerance for heat is much better than it has been in years past. But it gets to a point where, you know, I'm sweating through shirt after shirt after shirt um, all day long. You know, I go out for a bike ride in the morning, and when I get back uh, an hour later, my shirt, I could literally just take it off and wring it out and you would see the water come out of that. It's unbelievable. I shared that on Facebook. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing. It absolutely amazes me. Uh, the way the heat comes and goes pretty much this year. It's just been coming. Good. He got the link. Awesome. All right, tubers. I am getting talked out now. I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream for tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Got some good information. Once again, stay safe. If you're in the southeast, northeast, if you're dealing with these hot temperatures, follow the guidelines and you too can weather the summer heat. Please continue to like and subscribe. And as always, have a blessed day, everybody.